In this episode, Spectre of the Gun, the first frontier meets the final frontier. The classic American West set against the infinity of space. This episode was quite different than the usual big message stories for which the series was known. The highly stylized recreation of the famous gunfight at OK Corral and the entire episode had an almost comic book feeling about it. Originally titled The Last Gunfighter, this episode didn't please Leonard Nimoy, who had definite problems with the plot. He felt it was an unrealistic story which contained many character inconsistencies and gratuitous violence. Interestingly, this episode was written by none other than Gene Kuhn. At this point, he had left his staff job at Star Trek and was under contract elsewhere. Since he couldn't legally write for the series as Gene Kuhn anymore, he used his pseudonym, Lee Cronin. Now, Spectre of the Gun. I mean, Billy, come along. Yes, sir. Billy, please don't even go near him. I've gone through this in my head over and over, and it's changed over the years, but the favorite episode in which I appeared was Spectre of the Gun. You shouldn't have come back to town, Billy. Morgan will kill you because he wants me. With his outdated weapon, if he shoots at me, I will just... Step out of the way. Chekhov gets to kiss the girl. He gets shot. <coughs> dies. He comes back. Captain, I don't understand. Neither do I. He's in perfect health. And beyond that, this is one of those cases where necessity, being the mother of invention, we had a very, we had a highly stylized show. The, uh, because we had uh, our budget was was particularly short on on this particular episode, and I don't know the reason why uh, offhand. And rather than trying to conceal the fact that we were only using storefronts, we were using facades, they integrated that into this, this show. Obviously, this represents the Malkotians' concept of an American frontier town, circa 1880. It's just bits and pieces. It's incomplete. And it gave it a very eerie, uh, otherworldly sense. And I thought that the show stood out because of that, because of that stylized approach that they used. The episode was a Spectre of the Gun, and I played Wyatt Earp. It was a strange situation because Rex uh, Holman and Charlie Maxwell and I were hired to be the three Earp boys. Take my bag. And then Sam Gilman was hired to be Doc Holliday. When we read the script, at least speaking for myself, it, it really looked like somewhat of a dud. And when we showed up on the set and saw the stylized buildings and so on and so forth, it, it seemed to be even more of a dud. And uh, uh, the director, uh, Vince McAveedy, who was a very nice guy, he would uh, juxtapose our positions, you know, and, and it was all part of the, the, the design of the show it, it, to make it more of a uh, surrealistic fantasy kind of thing, you know, where in one cut we were walking a certain way in terms of our relationship to each other, and then the next cut, for no reason at all, we were completely reversed, which didn't make a lot of sense to us, but made a lot of sense to him, and he was right, because uh, the show, in a very strange way, turned out to be one of the... Uh, you know, the classic Star Trek. Captain, a most curious development on Scanner 57. Let's all take a look at it, Mr. Spock. By this point in the third season, our production budget had been significantly 
reduced. Since we didn't have a lot of money to create a complex set, producer Fred Freiberger and Bob Justman came up with a plan to make Spectre of the Gun work. Together with scenic designer Matt Jeffries, they created a surrealistic yet inexpensive set. It ended up working very well. It was a reflection of the fragments of human memory and at the same time, a solution to our money problems. Captain, a most curious development on scanner 57. Let's all take a look at it, Mr. Spock. It seemed to me that there was something very life-affirming and very positive about Star Trek. Uh, it, I think it touched a lot of people uh, because uh, uh, it wasn't just the fact that Bill and Leonard and uh, Scotty and so on and so forth were, were overcoming adversity. We come in peace, but we'll defend ourselves if necessary. They were dealing with rather esoteric problems that people could sort of strange things that people could sort of hang their hats on and, and, and they could sort of uh, uh, live, empathize with, with, with what the characters were doing. I mean, if you look at some of the stories, th they weren't the common kind of story. They were very special. I wonder how humanity managed to survive. We overcame our instinct for violence. Each show is a morality play of its own within this kind of uh, uh, high-tech uh, framework. Evil does seek to maintain power by suppressing the truth or by misleading the innocent. It's just one of those strange chemistry things, and, and, and it happened. And I was very fortunate to be part of it. Captain, a most curious development on scanner 57. Let's all take a look at it, Mrs. Spock. Here, for the first time in the series history, the characters seem to actually have learned something through their previous experiences. Spock looked back at Catspaw, the Squire of Gothus, and the cage. Kirk remembers the bluff from the Corbomite maneuver. He decides to forge ahead while facing a dangerous situation. And that's why he was Captain Kirk.